Good day to everyone joining us and welcome to today's X Talks webinar. Today's talk is entitled Applying Advanced Analytics to Overcome CNS Trial Challenges. My name is Ryan Muse and I'll be your X Talks host for today. Today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes and this presentation includes a Q&A session with our speakers. Now, the webinar is designed to be interactive and webinars work best when you're involved. So please feel free to submit your questions and comments for our speakers throughout the presentation using the questions chat box and we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. This chat box is located in the control panel, which is on the right hand side of your screen. And if you require any assistance along the way, please contact me at any time by sending a message using this same chat panel. At this time, know that all participants are in listen only mode. And please note that the event will be recorded and made available for streaming on xtalks.com. At this point, I'd like to thank Signet Health, who developed the content for this presentation. Signet Health is the evidence generation company. They are focused on leveraging software, deep therapeutic and scientific knowledge, and operational expertise to consistently generate quality evidence for clinical studies across traditional, virtual, and hybrid trial models. For more than 20 years, over 400 sponsors and CROs of all sizes, including all of Top 20 Pharma, have trusted Signet Health Solutions for remote, on-site based ECOA, e-consent, RTSM, supply chain management, and data quality analytics. Now I would like to introduce our speakers for today's event. Professor John Harrison is an expert psychologist with a special interest in cognition. John is principal consultant at Metis Cognition, a psychology practice established to advise with the selection and successful integration of cognitive testing into therapeutic development programs. He is also an associate professor with the AU's MC Alzheimer's Center and has authored or co-authored more than 80 books and scientific articles, including a popular neuroscience book, Synesthesia, The Strangest Thing. And Colin Saunder, a PhD, is a director and clinical scientist at Karuna Therapeutics. He has both academic and industry experience in clinical trial design, utilizing or utilization of novel biomarkers and endpoints, and the use of data analytics to mitigate risk and improve trial outcomes. At Karuna Therapeutics, Colin oversees the implementation of ECOA for multiple Phase three programs, including the integration of ECOA data into blinded review processes for ongoing studies. Colin received his PhD in clinical psychology from Stony Brook University and is a licensed psychologist. And Dr. Cott is a practice leader for data analytics at Signet Health. He has both academic and industry experience in clinical trials. Having led the development of the data analytics program for Signet, he has overseen the design and implementation of data analytics across all Signet supported trials. Prior to Signet Health, Dr. Cott worked as an assistant professor at Charles University First Medical Faculty, Department of Psychiatry in Prague, Czech Republic. And without further ado though, I would like to hand the presentation over to our very first speaker today, John Harrison, you may begin whenever you're ready. Brian, thank you so much for the uh, very nice introduction and, and thank you to you and your colleagues for such outstanding efforts in preparing us for today. Um, let me close my thanks at the beginning with just a, a big thank you to Signet for this opportunity to discuss some thoughts around identifying appropriate participants for Alzheimer's disease trials. So let's go to full screen on the slide deck. Okay, so I've got about 10 to 15 minutes and I, I'm going to keep this pretty pithy and straightforward and to the point and, and I, that's a characteristic I hope of all my presentations from this point forward. Um, I'm going to think about what we do when we construct a protocol synopsis for the, tr the classic Alzheimer's disease clinical trial and, and I have the sense, maybe some people on the call share this sentiment with me, that we, we are very formulaic. We have go-to tools which we select and they get pretty much rubber stamped. So we, we, we think that there's an appropriate template for how to conduct trials. Um, I just wanna chip away at that premise a little bit today. So I'm just gonna ask the question, what is the virtue always of reaching for, in this particular instance, a test like the mini mental states exam? And I'm just gonna think about why we might want to use it and are there options that we might more sensibly use if we were pursuing a therapeutic claim for a drug which was not to do with memory. So maybe one of the other domains of cognition. So that's what I want to achieve in the next 10 minutes or so. 
and in broad terms, I think it breaks down like this. This is essentially the, the menu for today. So who do we want? Why do we want them? And then how do we select them? And, and it's going to be part of that process. Time doesn't allow for a very thorough account of the usual inclusion and exclusion criteria, which not unusually run to a side of US letter or English A4 these days. So we're very prescriptive about who gets into our trials and we take lots of precautions to ensure that we have what we regard as the right population. Um, and to kick off with, it would be remiss of me not to tell you for whom I'm currently working. Um, there's quite a lot of names on there. So what I will do after today is I'll post this presentation onto my Academia webpage. Uh, a link to that is in the very final slide. So if you don't have time to comb through this right now, please be assured that you can digest it at your leisure after today's event. So why select using the MMSC? Well, on reflection, and, and I've often asked the question in an advisory board context, what, what do we think the virtue of selecting the mini mental states exam might be? Because ultimately, the, the mini mental states exam was designed as a bedside test of global cognition. The, the, the circumstances in which I think the test thrives is you've got a new arrival onto a neurology ward, you're a senior medic, and you want a quick picture, quick gestalt of that patient's cognition. You give the MMSE to one of your colleagues, maybe even do it yourself. Ten minutes later, you get a number. And in very broad terms, that, that number is meaningful. So I think if you're familiar with the Mini Mental States exam and you've worked in a healthcare environment, if I told you that somebody had an LMSE of 23, it would impart reasonable information to you. I think it's a good general description of where they're at cognitively. But it is now a nearly 50 year old test. And in the intervening five decades, we have learned a good deal more about presentation of cognition in particularly early Alzheimer's disease. And the emphasis on memory, whilst welcome, it really does require more breadth. And, and I think the MMSE is showing its age ever so slightly, but it, it's so ubiquitous. It's just used in so many contexts that I think there's a certain amount of comfort attached to its use and its selection. But I just want to ask the question today if that's actually serving us as well as it might. And when I reflect on the reasons for selecting the MMSE um, to determine an inclusion range, I come up with essentially three possible ideas. One of them is to ensure that the people we're selecting have a rescuable deficit. As, as we push back in earlier and earlier into the disease, I think we all get a lot of comfort from knowing that the people coming into our study have a decrement in cognition which potentially we can rescue with our therapeutic intervention. So I think that's one of the principal reasons why we would want to select on a metric like the Mini Mental States exam. Um, I think also we want to ensure that people can complete the study measures we've selected. So one of the things we want to avoid wherever possible is floor effects on our outcome measures. So individuals who simply do, do so poorly on our test that they register no score whatsoever. So I, I think the pitching of the range is designed to ensure that there are no ceiling effects, people don't perform perfectly, and there are no floor effects. And I think the other possible reason for its inclusion is we've maybe modeled expected results from our study. So there's, there's a whole industry of looking at variables like the MMSE, the Clinical Dementia Rating Scale, and I think we've become reasonably competent at characterizing the kinds of individuals in whom we may see a therapeutic effect. Really good example of that, you know, lots of work done by um, various individuals, Jeremy Hobart and colleagues, suggesting that the sweet spot for an efficacy evaluation in Alzheimer's disease of the ADAS-COG is an MMSE score of about 15. So, so we have some sense, I think, of why we want to get people in. And if our drug is pro-memory, then I think that makes perfectly good sense. And the MMSE is very largely a test of memory. So I, I've lumped orientation to place and to time as memory outcome metrics. I don't think that's controversial. I think that if you know who you are, where you are in time and space, it's because you listened to the radio this morning, you read the newspaper, somebody told you, or you read your appointment letter. So I, I'm going to consider orientation to be memory. And I think the remainder of that list of MMSE items is pretty uncontroversial. The, the notorious Apple penny table, which most of my study participants know before I even give them the MMSE, is ostensibly a test of episodic memory, actually semantic memory in many of the people I evaluate, 
But that idea that we're testing memory is very much front and center with the MMSE. And there, there's sort of a nod in the direction of practice language and attention, but I, I don't think we feel that the MMC does a terribly good job of indexing those functions. And just to testify to the, the truth of the MMSE being a good metric of memory, um, if we correlate baseline MMSE with ADAS COG performance, we're rewarded with typically a correlation of about 0.7 or better. Uh, and I mention this in passing just because I know some of the content of today's seminar is about how we can benefit from expectation. So if you know what the baseline MMSE is, using a regression equation of the kind that's depicted here, you could predict with relative certainty, one word either way, what the likely score on word recall could be. So, so there's another means by which we might just parse the data to make sure that it looks reasonable and meets expectation. But fundamentally, MMSE is a test of memory. And that's fine as far as it goes, but we now understand perfectly well that Alzheimer's disease is a disorder of a number of facets of cognition. So episodic memory, working memory, attention, executive function, these, these are the four where I think cognitive action is most at home. If, if people have problems with praxis and language, I think often the core deficit might reside in one of those other four areas of cognition. But we do acknowledge, and there's a very rich literature now, substantiating the idea that actually people can present with profound deficits in other areas rather than memory. Memory often is impaired, but it's not unusual to find other domains, even very early on, similarly impaired. And if we've got a, an MCI taxonomy, and this is one of a number I could have shown you, this reflects that variability, I think. So there's amnestic, people report memory difficulties, there's multiple domains, single domains, verbal, visual, verbal, presumably reflecting where the pathology has accumulated most early in the disease process for that individual. So I think we've acknowledged for some years now that actually Alzheimer's presents very variably. Um, certainly, you know, in our experience in the clinic in Amsterdam, you know, we're seeing people in their mid forties, still in work, still driving, who do have issues with memory, but often their deficits are more noticeable in the context of their work, for example. People with very demanding jobs notice quite often if their attention or their executive function is starting to decline. So in that landscape, we have a much more thorough understanding of cognition. And, and what about if we have a compound that may be pro-memory, but it might actually be preferentially benefiting other areas of cognition? Does it still make sense to use the mini mental states exam with its heavy focus on memory as a means of recruiting people in? I'd just like to invite the possibility that we could, should, and must do better with this. If we have a drug which we believe is going to be beneficial for attention or for executive function or working memory, it seems to me that it makes much more sense to enrich the study cohort based on evidence of deficit in that domain, plus ensuring they can complete the study measures. So back to that earlier slide. So if you had somebody who had an attentional deficit, it seems to me that it might make better sense to recruit on the basis of a deficit on a measure of attention, like a coding or a digit simple substitution test. Similarly, if you had an expectation of treatment benefit on working memory, you might choose to enrich on an NBAC task or one of the classic paper and pencil working memory paradigms. Similarly, executive function, very broad umbrella term, many different aspects to executive function, but for example, if people were having difficulty with planning and organization, something like a verbal fluency test for phonology would be, I would judge, a relatively good inclusion criterion for getting the right kind of study participant. So I think it behooves us to be a little more flexible. And th this isn't just a, a speculative idea for presentation at today's webinar. It's something we've actually put into pro progress. So, there are now a number of ongoing trials where we have incorporated the LMSE. We just like to benchmark our cohort at baseline so we can compare with other studies. But we focused very much on other metrics as a means of recruiting people into the study. This is one example. So we, we've published the, the plan for the ongoing study being conducted by Vivorion. And here we've used the waste for coding score test as a means of getting what we believe to be the right people. The primary outcome measure in the study is attention and working memory, a composite of those measures. So it made much more sense to enrich the cohort for deficits in those areas 
than necessarily memory as we would have done it had we just used the mini mental states exam. So in summary, very quick pithy account of what I think we might choose to do. I think it's absolutely crucial that we assess all relevant cognitive domains, particularly in an exploratory study. Let's make sure we run the gamut of cognition just so that if we do find any positive treatment effects, we can identify them early in our study work and then maybe shape our confirmatory and later studies on the basis of what we've observed in those exploratory media. Um, reliable, sensitive and valid measures. Uh, it sounds obvious in any other area of medicine, I probably wouldn't have to mention that, but we, we are still saddled with some very unreliable, insensitive and not always valid measures. And, and we probably could do a little better there. Um, and I would absolutely select my trial outcome measures expect, according to expected effects, not just based on the, the history of what we tend to do. So the ADES-COG is not a perfect measure. There are others that you might reasonably contemplate. And I think just reaching for it every time doesn't always serve us as well as it might. So a quick summary. Um, thank you very much for paying attention for, to me today. I'm, I'm delighted to hear from anybody who wants to remonstrate with me, raise questions, raise issues. There are plenty of means by which you can get hold of me. Um, ultimately, if you Google John Harrison Psychologist, you'll probably find me as well. I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much for your attention. And now pass to Colin, who is next up with presentation. Colin, good luck. Thanks, John. All right. So uh, thanks, everyone, um, uh, for joining us today. And, and thank you to Signet for putting this, uh, this excellent panel together. I'm going to briefly talk today about uh, blinded data review. And, and essentially, you know, the question here is, what can we do in an ongoing trial to mitigate risk um, using blinded data? Um, and what are the potential um, downsides to that approach? Uh, so just to start off here, uh, you know, I'm an employee of Kruna Therapeutics, and, and the views here are, 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 are my own and not necessarily reflect the views of Kruna. So what's the problem we're trying to solve? Um, I think probably everyone on this uh, webinar is, is aware of the um, uh, trend towards uh, fewer and fewer approvals in CNS and longer odds, so to speak. And so here's an example uh, from schizophrenia. Uh, and what you can see here in this uh, this nice uh, review by the FDA is that uh, over time uh, we're seeing a trend towards increasing placebo response um, and a trend towards a decreasing overall treatment effect. Obviously, um, this is bad. So uh, the question here is, you know, what can we do to help um, mitigate some of this and and, and improve the probability of success in any given trial. You know, obviously a lot of things are out of our control, um, you know, whether or not the, the drug is, is actually uh, doing what you think it is, uh, you know, factors that, that go beyond uh, trial oversight. But there are some things I would argue that we can do on an ongoing basis um, that may be helpful in reducing variance and then ultimately mitigating uh, placebo response and hopefully, uh, uh, removing uh, problematic uh, sites, or uh, uh, et cetera. So my argument is really based on the idea that sites are the key organizational level in clinical trials. Um, they vary widely in terms of their size, both in terms of the number of subjects enrolled, but also the size of the actual organization, the characteristics of participants. A simple example of this might be, uh, you know, sites are going to have uh, higher BMIs in um, in the southeast than they are in the northeast, and then also in overall quality, which really is a very diffuse and unclear measure that really reflects multiple things, um, but certainly includes operational characteristics and characteristics of the the rater and the PI. And I believe uh, Alan here after me will talk a little bit more about rater quality. And so the idea here is that sites on the extreme, so if we think about uh, performance in sites in any given study, maybe you have 50, 50 sites in a study, any site that uh, is on the extreme or is an outlier may negatively impact trial uh, results. Um, they certainly add variance. And so then the question is, is there a way we can identify problematic sites early um, and, and potentially intervene uh, before they contribute a large amount of data? 
And, and, and this really brings up the question of a blinded data analysis or blinded review of ongoing data. So uh, just before we start, a, a word of caution, not all outliers are bad. Uh, sometimes in, in trials, you'll see outliers um, that actually are, are beneficial for you. Um, you know, this is an example from um, the approval of esketamine or Stravato. Um, that approval is based on uh, a randomized withdrawal study and uh, an acute study or, or, or you know, an RCT, a, a traditional design. Um, this randomized withdrawal study was one of the two key uh, pivotal trials for efficacy. Uh, and the FDA noted in their review that there was a single site in Poland uh, where 100% of the individuals on placebo relapsed and that that was driving uh, the efficacy result. And so you can see that here at the bottom. I know it's a little difficult to see. You know, this is obviously, uh, in terms of drug approval, a good outlier to have. Now, we could argue whether or not you want outliers in general, but, but certainly not all outliers are bad. That being said, you know, I think the, the field has proven that we're not always so lucky. So here's an example again. Um, this is from uh, Benipertin studies and negative symptoms. There were three large phase three programs. All of them were negative. And um, this is data from a post hoc analysis uh, that essentially went in and said, OK, well, what if we go and remove sites where the scores on the, the endpoint um, varied substantially. So they're, they're going up and down in sort of a jagged way. Um, and, and, and what you find is, and this is just one example of the three studies, there, there are similar results for the other studies, is that when you exclude uh, sites that are affected with these erratic rating patterns, um, you see a, a, a drop in the, uh, in the placebo response. So the affected sites here are in red. You can see a larger placebo response in these sort of highly variable clinical presentations, which you wouldn't uh, necessarily expect um, to be representative of the true clinical presentation, particularly with regard to negative symptoms. They shouldn't bounce around all that much. But that being said, a post hoc analysis doesn't always help you that much. So the question here is, what can we do with data to mitigate risk? Um, and so what I'm going to talk about is primarily the ways in which we can use site data to mitigate risk. Um, but I want to just bring up that there are other ways to use blinded data to compare your study performance uh, to others. So we can look at a country level, for example, do two countries differ systematically in terms of their patient characteristics, their endpoint characteristics, et cetera. Um, we can compare uh, a given study to uh, contemporary studies. Uh, so for example, I have my phase three study in schizophrenia. I can compare early termination rates in my study to other studies to see am I trending uh, towards a, a substantially higher or lower or identical ET rate. And then finally, we can look within a program. So are the results uh, consistent across phase three studies? Um, and to what extent are they consistent with uh, prior uh, phase two studies, for example. Um, and then with insight, we can also use blinded data to compare across sites. And that's really, like I said, what I want to focus on here. And the idea here is we can use data to examine sites, to identify outliers, and, and we can do this in really one of two ways. We can have sort of a data-driven approach where we simply look at the data and identify any outliers and then interpret that. The alternative is sort of more of a theory-driven approach or a deductive approach where we say, okay, we're interested in this one particular characteristic. Let's go look at that and see if any of our sites are varying substantially or if our studies are varying substantially. And so I'll give an example of the latter first, right? So let's talk about age and enrollment. So in schizophrenia trials, age may be an important indicator of treatment differentiation, right? So you can see here, uh, again, a uh, nice meta-analysis uh, recently published. And what you can see is that as subjects get older in clinical trials in schizophrenia, you see less placebo drug differentiation. So let's just take a hypothetical scenario here. Let's say you have a phase two study, it's successful, maybe you have an upper limit of 55 uh, for enrollment and a mean age of 38. So given that this seems to be related to treatment effect, it would be reasonable to monitor this uh, in your ongoing phase three trial. And then what happens if the age is much increased in phase three? 
So perhaps halfway through the trial, you're finding that the, the age is trending towards uh, a full five years uh, higher than it was in the phase two. This may give you some pause. And so the question is at this point, what can you do or what should you do to monitor this potentially influential uh, factor um, that has to do with the participant characteristics that, uh, of your sites? And so this is just an example. Um, this is data that Signet was kind enough to, to put together for us. Um, so in this hypothetical data set, what you can see is that sites vary substantially in these sort of uh, characters at the bottom or individual sites. And so what you can see is sites vary in some meaningful ways in terms of their age of enrollment at site. And I'll, I'll focus here just on this last site, although we could, we could actually talk about a couple of the sites on the far end of the distribution. And what you can tell from this it, uh, box plot is that not only is the median age at this site uh, quite a bit older than a number of other studies, but that the data is quite skewed. And so what you're finding here, what this suggests is that a large portion of subjects from this site are older than your average study uh, participant. So what do you do with that? Well, I guess you could call up the site and say, hey, stop giving us you know, 55 year olds, but you know, that's not a problem within the protocol, that's acceptable. The real question is, is this meaningful in some way? So as I mentioned, you know, at that site, there's this example site, it, it, the age is both higher than the study average and it's showing a restricted range. So we have a, a lot of subjects that are all older. So how does that potentially impact clinical presentation? So again, hypothetical data here. So let's assume this is your PANS uh, distribution score at baseline. So you have here, as you can see, a, a mean score of 90 on the PANS at study baseline. Um, and and a standard deviation around 15. You know, we would obviously compare this to the phase two study, but let's say we're pretty happy with this. What I'll point out is that this site, JSJ and I, um, has a substantially lower baseline score uh, on the PANS than the study average. So the question then would be, is this a problem? Well, I would argue probably something's not right here. So we're seeing both older subjects and we're seeing um, reduced acuity at baseline. Both of those are, are risks. A second approach is instead of picking a, a, a variable that you think might be meaningful, such as age, we can simply take a look at the data and allow the data to find sites that are outliers and then determine whether or not that's a meaningful outlier that you're concerned about versus a meaningful outlier that you're not, or perhaps not even a, a meaningful outlier at all. I mean, there is going to be variability across sites. Um, for example, BMI, again, in South Florida, if the BMI is higher than my study sites in Boston, I wouldn't be all that surprised. And so what I'll show you here is an example of how you might use quality indicators, uh, which is something that you know Alan may talk a little bit about here, and endpoint data to identify theoretically problematic sites. So again, here's an example um, of what we might do. So this, this data generated by, by, by Signet, what you can see here is we're looking at change from baseline. So this is perhaps PAN scores at the end of the study. And so you're seeing, okay, on average in our blinded data, the PANS is dropping by 12 points, the standard deviation is 18. So looking at this data, there's a site here that's concerning to me, this site, QMQ. Why am I concerned about this site? Well, a couple things. One, the average change at that site is much higher than my study average. But importantly, the standard deviation is much lower. So what that indicates to me is that not only are subjects getting a lot better at that site than the study average, but everyone is getting better at that site. In other words, the data is clustered together um, quite tightly. So the follow-up here that we might do is take a look at some quality indicators. And these are generated by Signet here. I mean, what you can see here is that at that site, we're seeing a lot of PANS item discrepancies. So that's, for example, a, a subject that uh, reports very few delusions or has a low score on delusions, but perhaps a very high score on suspicion and persecution. You would not expect that to happen. Right. We're also seeing very large changes in this data, um, and we're also seeing critically some erratic ratings. So if you remember from the from the beta pertin example at the very beginning of my presentation, erratic ratings are bad. 
And so here's just an example of uh, each line here uh, would represent an individual subject's data. And you can see here highlighted in the middle, these, these two lines that bounce around across study weeks. They're going up and down and up and down. And so again, when you look at all of this data together, it would suggest that this site is certainly not a site that we would want to give even more subjects to if we have that option. And it's potentially a site you might even want to stop from enrollment because you're seeing what is likely a large placebo response at that site, given that there's such a large overall response and the, the spread of the data is small. But in addition, you're seeing a lot of quality indicators that suggest um, risk, so erratic rating, for example. So to summarize here, you know, blind review of data in an ongoing study is, is a powerful tool. And it's something that I would suggest that, that we use um, to review our data and to try and mitigate risk as the study progresses. And there are a couple ways to do this. As I've illustrated, you can have specific uh, variables or, uh, uh, you know, such as age that you're interested in. You can simply do a systematic review of the data to identify outliers. Um, and while I really just focused here on some endpoint data and some demographic data, I'll also point out that, you know, there are lots of other additional metrics you might want to use. Operational metrics, for example, protocol deviations, rate or quality, which, you know, Alan's going to talk about here briefly. I mean, these are all things that we would incorporate among, along with these other variables, demographic, et cetera, to get a broad picture of the site. And to be able to say, okay, when I bring all this data together, are all of the indicators pointing in the same direction? If so, and I'm worried about that, then perhaps now is the time to uh, to take action. But to end here, I just want to say, you know, I, I would recommend, while I think this is important, you need to proceed with caution. Not all outliers are bad. And ultimately, the proof is in the pudding, or the proof is when you unblind the data. And there are certainly plenty of examples, and I know, um, you know, Alan and, and, and David Daniel and others from Signet have talked about this, where the quality indicators seem to indicate, oh, this site has got some, some problems going on. But then at the end, you unblind their data and you find a large placebo drug differentiation at that site. So you never can be entirely certain. And that's why I think after looking at all the data, it's probably a good idea to just have a drink. So uh, I'll stop there and, and hand it over to Alan. Um, thank you for your time and attention. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Colin. And uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, John and Colin for their excellent presentations. And uh, in the next uh, uh, 10 to 15 minutes, uh, I would like to spend discussing the use of machine learning uh, to identify risks to uh, data uh, quality uh, in uh, collected in clinical trials. Now, uh, Colin already mentioned uh, or spoke quite a lot about uh, some data quality concerns, and uh, we know that these are quite frequent in clinical trial data, irrespective of indication. And uh, unfortunately, the presence of uh, many of these uh, data quality concerns may have quite a negative consequence uh, for the study. So let me show you what I have, uh, what I have in mind. These are my uh, disclosures. I'm the full-time uh, employee at uh, Signan Health. And uh, back to the topic. This is a, a snapshot of uh, 17 uh, acute uh, schizophrenia clinical trials. The data were collected from uh, over uh, 45,000 visits. Uh, roughly six and a half thousand uh, subjects are included in here. And what you can appreciate is that the amount of uh, data quality concerns, uh, even though uh, they vary uh, from trial to trial, uh, averages to roughly 27% uh, of the data. So that's a fairly large proportion of visits that do suffer by some type of uh, data quality, uh, quality issue. And when we are interested in the types of issues that, that, that actually made that prior graph, uh, we identify about 5% of data uh, that uh, exhibit extreme levels of variability. So those would be the erratic ratings that uh, Colin mentioned uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, within PENS errors affect roughly around 10% uh, of all the data. Uh, those uh, are the errors, again, uh, Colin mentioned previously, 
uh, for example, discordance between the uh, delusions, uh, the persecutory delusions, and the severity of delusions in general. Lack of variability in the sample affected almost 17% uh, of the trial data and or of the of the data set, and almost 20% of uh, of uh, assessments that were reviewed by uh, independent reviewers and and independently scored had a, a meaningful a clinically meaningful uh, discordance in the uh, in the uh, rater and reviewer uh, scores. These all are fairly clinically meaningful uh, meaningful findings, and unfortunately. Uh, they come, as I already mentioned, uh, with, a, uh, with an associated cost. This is a, a retrospective analysis of an acute, uh, acute uh, clinical trial. And uh, here we looked into the impact of various indices of aberrant variability on the uh, drug placebo separation and uh, individual uh, treatment arms. So, so the effect of the, uh, of the findings on placebo arm and the treatment arm separately. And what we found was that there was a differential effect of these uh, extreme variability indices, such as erratic ratings, or the opposite of those, identical or ni ni uh, nearly identical uh, ratings. Uh, so we found a differential uh, effect on the treatment arm and the placebo arm, and ultimately taken together, this resulted uh, in the uh, uh, affected subjects not being able to separate uh, the uh, active treatment from uh, placebo. So there truly is uh, 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 quite a, a meaningful cost associated with the presence of these, uh, these uh, data quality concerns. Uh, and especially if these appear to be frequently present in the, uh, in the data. So now that we know that uh, data are uh, in quite some large volumes affected by uh, data quality concerns, uh, and we know that there is the potential for a, a detrimental effect of these uh, on signal detection, the question is what can be done uh, about that? And again, Colin spoke about the implementation of blind data uh, analytics. Uh, and this is an approach that has been uh, taken lately in many CNS clinical trials. Now, one of the key aspects of analytics that we strongly believe in uh, is the fact that uh, the findings need to be actionable. And our analytics uh, offer a unique combination of uh, the identification of issues through algorithms and, and statistical approaches, but as well, uh, these are coupled with uh, uh, very careful clinical interpretation and ultimately uh, a, a, an action or a customized intervention, if you will, uh, focusing uh, on the identified issues. However, one of the key features in implementing uh, a data analytics solution into a trial should as well be prevention. And yes, you can argue that by uh, performing maybe an outreach to the, to the site and remediating uh, data quality issues there, you are uh, in, in, in a certain way preventing uh, future errors from happening. But irrespective of how good your intervention actually is, the data concerns that were already identified remain in the data set and, and uh, poten have the potential to weaken your signal. So the question is whether we could be more bold about uh, this here and build a system that would prevent the future errors from happening. Now, I have been with Signum for many years, and uh, I was uh, at the very beginning of uh, when we started to build our analytic solution here. And I believe uh, many will agree with me that over the last 10, 15 years, we have seen a huge amount of progress uh, in the field of analytics uh, in clinical trials. When I started, most of the trials were still paper-based and it was a nightmare to get the data uh, into an electronic form and available for analysis. Analyses typically happened uh, once or twice throughout the trial, were highly retrospective, and the potential to meaningfully intervene was basically absent. 
Now, with the advance of uh, EDC and especially the adoption of ECOA and EPRO solutions, we suddenly have the data at our fingertips, basically in real time for an immediate analysis. And uh, we have the ability to intervene as close to the particular visit uh, as possible uh, in time. However, it is mainly the advances in machine learning that allow a paradigm shift uh, in how we conceptually think about data analytics. Now we do not need to operate in a reactive mode anymore and address already identified issues. For the first time, we actually can identify future data quality concerns and intervene even before the data are actually collected. Machine learning uh, has been associated with extreme hopes, basically a panacea for almost anything, uh, but as well with huge disappointments. And we need to be very realistic about uh, machine learning potentials. Now, in the first place, we need to uh, consider what we want the product to be. We believe that the four principles that are mentioned here on the slide are critical for a successful uh, machine learning product. The models need to be as generalizable as possible so that you can reuse them. Now, CNS research uh, is, uh, from this perspective, not the ideal substrate because uh, barely uh, or very rarely uh, there will be two or more uh, trials or programs that will share, share a, a reasonable number of commonalities that you would be able to, to utilize. But still, uh, there are many similarities that you can use to your advantage. For example, uh, within a, a particular indication, it is usually the same set of instruments that is being used uh, at screening. Additionally, uh, the model needs to provide actionable outcomes. That is, there uh, should be no doubt about what should happen and when it should happen if the, the, the system, the model, identifies future risks. And lastly, and most importantly, the model or, or the models implemented uh, should address only those problems that are relevant and that have the potential to significantly impact the study outcomes. So let me give you one example of how we are applying these uh, at Signet. And I will be speaking specifically about the Witten Pants errors, uh, uh, that is, logical inconsistencies uh, in the way how the instrument is being scored. For those who are not familiar with schizophrenia, Pants is a, is a complex scale uh, that is used to assess the severity uh, and response to treatment uh, in schizophrenia. And many of the items that are there measure similar concepts. So you would expect a, a close uh, association uh, if these items uh, of these items to, uh, together. Now, if this uh, association is missing, this may be for a, a, a plethora of reasons. And I will defer to this lack of association subsequently as uh, within Penn's errors. And this can be representative of some idiosyncratic scoring or administration practices a, a, a particular rater may have. It may stem from lack of understanding uh, of, the, of the instruments, uh, its scoring guidelines, etc. Uh, there may be lack of rigor in the way how the scale is used and some random noise uh, may, be, may be introduced. And of course, uh, it can stem from uh, data manipulation. Now, similarly to the uh, to the uh, variability indices that I showed uh, a few slides ago, the presence of these within pens errors uh, comes uh, with a, a significant impact on placebo response and drug placebo separation. This is an analysis of two acute clinical trials. Uh, and in blue bars, you see the patients who were affected by the presence of uh, these within pens uh, errors. And you can appreciate that the placebo response on the graph on the left has been significantly increased in the uh, presence of these uh, errors compared to when these were, uh, were absent. Interestingly, uh, the same picture can be identified when we look at the size where the proportion of these errors was increased compared to the uh, other uh, study data. And most importantly, of course, the presence of these discrepancies 
uh, eliminated uh, the, the signal and the drug was not able to separate uh, from, uh, from placebo at the dose sites and at those subjects who were affected uh, by, these, uh, by these errors. We as well know that the presence of these errors uh, in screening uh, period is highly associated with the presence of these errors after the subject is randomized. Actually, the odds ratio is close to 11, uh, highly significant. Uh, and you could basically build a very simple, uh, 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 almost a mechanic uh, decision tree algorithm that uh, will determine whether a patient is at risk of future within PENS error based on, their, uh, on the presence of these errors in the screening period. However, uh, implementing this simple decision rule, rule will lead to about 43% uh, of uh, data to be missed uh, and uh, uh, another 43% of data uh, to be incorrectly uh, identified. Uh, so, so basically false, uh, false positive. So that, those numbers aren't great. And the question is whether we can do, uh, whether we can do better. So let me show you what we have, uh, we have done uh, here. And we have taken a very conscious decision here to build a pipeline that basically follows a, a, an onion structure. And uh, at the outer layer here, we have a parsimonious model that uses only the most common screening data available that can be reused across clinical trials. As the patient, uh, so when the patient enters the trial uh, and uh, provides uh, her screening data, those will be analyzed by just the, uh, the, the, the screening model, the blue one here on this graph. As the patient progresses to baseline, a second, more complex uh, model will be utilized that now includes both the screening and the baseline data and so on uh, with additional data available. For example, if we have audio reviews, uh, another model, once the audio review data will be uh, available, could be implemented. And we could go up to uh, build a model that would be specific uh, to the unique study data uh, and include that uh, in, the, uh, in, in, in the whole pipeline. Now you can appreciate that as we move from the left to the center of the onion, we are losing the uh, potential to generalize the, the models. The most generalizable is the model uh, that is basically forming the outer layer. And then as we move further and further to the center, we are using this generalizability. And therefore, we may not be able to reuse those models in other studies. And this is how the pipeline actually performs. Uh, the metric on the right uh, assesses the quality of the, uh, of the model. And just uh, uh, to, to explain what we are seeing, precision uh, is basically the percentage of correctly identified cases out of all that were predicted. So if, we, if the model predicted uh, nine, uh, 100 cases, 91 of those would be uh, correct and nine would be false positives. The recall is uh, a machine learning term for sensitivity. And basically, it is the probability that the model will identify uh, the, the cases out of all those who will have, uh, in our instance, uh, a written pants logical error uh, in, the, uh, in the future. So again, looking at the screening model only, uh, if there were uh, future 100 cases, the model will correctly identify 52 of those and the remaining 48 will be missed. Uh, the F1 score is then an ultimate metric of the model performance. And basically it's an harmonic mean of the precision and recall. So you have uh, both of these indices weighed equally into the performance of the model. And the closer this that uh, uh, or comes to a one, the better the model performance is. And what you can appreciate that as we increase the complexity of the models, the, uh, the, uh, the, the performance of the model improves. Now, the interesting thing is that the largest improvement we have identified in this particular case is uh, when we added the baseline data. At that point, the F1 score uh, 
uh, improved quite substantially. And additional uh, added complexities to the model improved the, the F1 score, but those were uh, less substantial uh, than, than, the original, uh, than the original channel. Now, what this tells us, uh, or what it means, is that uh, uh, you know, we don't necessarily need to discount the more complex models, but it definitely shows uh, that the simpler models, uh, and here especially the one uh, using the screening and the baseline data, are perfectly capable of identifying risks without huge loss in the model accuracy. So to summarize, uh, machine learning offers a paradigm shift uh, in uh, the way how we think about analytics and how we can perform analytics. It allows us for the first time to predict and address future data quality concerns even before the data are actually collected. We have taken a, a conscious approach to build models that are parsimonious, uh, highly reusable, uh, with as little data as possible, uh, and models that provide clinically relevant and actionable outcomes. For the uh, model to be successful, uh, it is of course critical to assess the risk in a very comprehensive way to determine what action and when the action should be taken. Now the stepwise uh, approach, uh, moving uh, through the layers of, of the onion, uh, as the subject data are collected, uh, uh, improves the performance of the model and allows us to intervene uh, when truly, uh, truly necessary. I would like to thank you for your, uh, for your attention. Uh, and as well, I would like to thank uh, my collaborators, Xing Mei, Emmanuel, and Andre, uh, who have a very uh, uh, alliance shared basically uh, in the uh, development of, of the machine uh, learning pipelines, one of those I, I presented uh, in this presentation. Thank you very much, and I believe we are now open for uh, discussion. Well, thank you very much for that insightful presentation, all of you. I would like to invite our audience to continue sending their questions or comments right now using the questions window for this Q&A portion of the webinar. Now, I've already received some questions, so we'll get ourselves started with those. Um, the very first question that we have for you would like to know, isn't an advantage of using the MMSE that individuals scoring the same result are by definition similar? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one, Ryan. Shalai seems seems to be up my street, so thank you for that, and and thank you for the question. But uh, within certain parameters, that's largely true. I mean, we are measuring cognition, and the limitations on what we measure with the MMSE mean that it's really memory, a little bit of language, a little bit of praxis. So there there will be some inherent similarity. However, and and this is always the legacy of portmanteau tests like the MMSE, where it's really a collection of subtests. Um, I could fairly readily show anybody who was interested three people scoring 24 out of 30 on the mini mental states exam all of whom had a fundamentally different deficit cognitively to one another so some might have an attentional deficit do badly on serial sevens some might have more of a mnemonic deficit and be okay on serial sevens so so I, scores of the same level do not guarantee that the patient is presenting in the same kind of fashion, I'm afraid. So no, that, that's not a guarantee with the MMSE. Very good, thank you very much. Um, we have a question that I believe would be directed to Alan, and it would like to know if you have some other models available or just the one that you showed. No, actually, we have a, a number of models that, that, that we've built, and, and we are really focusing uh, on the uh, most critical uh, indicators that, uh, that have the potential to uh, significantly impact on the drug placebo separation. Uh, so we have models that predict uh, extreme variability in the data. Uh, we have models predicting uh, discordances. Uh, in uh, between instruments and uh, not only in schizophrenia we have models uh, for uh, dementia trials and other indications uh, as well uh, so so uh, those are currently uh, currently available excellent thank you very much um, going back to MMSE uh, we have someone wondering would using the MOCA be a better selection method perhaps Ryan, I'll, I'll take that one as well, if that's okay. Th thank you for that, and, and thank you for the question. A, co a question I commonly get, 
Uh, in broad terms, I'm going to give a quick yes, but there's there's a little bit of a caveat to that, of course. So I, I would first of all, I'd want to know for what purpose were you going to employ the the mocker? So the it, it's it's again, it's a bedside test of global cognition. I think it's better than the MMSE in terms of domain coverage. So it does feature tests of executive function, better tests of praxis, some verbal fluency, which are unfortunately omitted in the MMSE. So domain coverage is better. It's still quite a limited scale. So, you know, it, it, it's not a good outcome measure in terms of measuring efficacy, I would judge. So if I, if I wanted to really measure the efficacy of a treatment, I would be looking for something with more sensitivity. And what do I mean by that? Well, you know, the verbal fluency test where you have phonological fluency on the mocha, instead of getting a range of scores, which is where you'd really want to be looking, you get a binary in the mocha score. So, so if it were a means of inclusion or you know, a bedside global test of cognition, I'd probably reach for the mocha over the MMSE. If I was looking at efficacy or safety in a treatment a trial, I'd absolutely be reaching for something else. Very good, excellent, thank you. Um, in Dr. Saunders' presentation, he reviewed a potential outlier site. A uh, question asks, they're curious, what would you do about that if this was a real site in your trial? It's a, it's a good question. You know, you, as I sort of indicated, you know, you have to proceed with caution um, when you're analyzing or looking at blinded data. Um, that being said, you know, I, I guess I guess the question is really about the the site that that had all the the the, the really restricted large change from baseline and 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 the quality indicators, et cetera. You know, I think that's an example where you have enough arrows or, or you know pointing in the same direction, all saying the same thing, which is that there is there is some meaningful issue at that site. Um, and, and so in that particular case, I think, you know, certainly we'd evaluate some other data, we'd pull in operational data and a few other things, um, you know, into that as well. But I think in that case, you know, we would probably uh, look to think about either halting the enrollment of that site or certainly, you know, commonly in trials, we, we make decisions at certain points, certain cut points about whether or not to allow sites to enroll more subjects. So there's sort of a review process and you say, oh, well, they've hit 10, let's say, do we give them another five subjects? Um, you know, certainly we wouldn't consider giving them more. So, I, I, you know, it's always case by case and you might follow up the site, but, but in, in that case, I think the data would be pretty clearly indicating there's a problem. Very good, thank you. Um, our, we have a question wondering if the panel can speak more to the risks of intervening in ongoing trials. Uh, I mean, I, I, I'm curious what others think. I mean, I'll just say here briefly, you know, you're, you're balancing risk if you don't intervene at all, um, then, you know, you, you run the risk of allowing that example bad site to enroll a lot of subjects and, and Give you a huge placebo response to sync your trial. If you intervene too frequently, you run the risk of censoring too much data and, and, and slowing your enrollment down, and then end up finding that hey, that site was actually just fine. They were just they they were just odd in, in some way. So it is a fine balance, I think. I don't know what uh, John Allen, if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah just really quickly, I, um, I, I think, first of all, a comment, but also a possible remedy. So I, I guess one of the challenges is if you find that a scale is being doing, been done fundamentally incorrectly at baseline, um, so that you're going to get a very different metric at follow-up if you then remediate the, the raters. So that, that's going to be an issue. You're going to confound the data by definition because you're changing the parameters of how the test is done. Um, the remedy for that, for me, always do these things at screening. You know, the great thing about brief, reliable, valid, sensitive outcome metrics, put them into your screening assessment, then you get to check the returns from site before you take the golden baseline metric. So I think if, if you're worried about the need for remediation, check what goes on at screening, intervene before it becomes trial critical. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. I think uh, focusing on the screening data is critical. Uh, and intervening there before the subject gets randomized. 
Uh, it is, I think, a fundamental difference if we have a hard error uh, identified in the in the data, and when there is a soft sign of some some outlying uh, outlier of the data that may be possibly uh, normal. And we should always uh, approach this in a very humble humble way before we decide to uh, to intervene. As well, the, the machine learning algorithms that we are building are really designed to pick the screening data. Uh, first and, and baseline potentially so that we can intervene very early on if we need to then to wait for the errors to, to happen uh, because then of course we are married to the errors uh, in the data set and that would prevent uh, prevent uh, or uh, that can affect the signals but as well as uh, John you correctly mentioned it may alter the behavior uh, of the rater and potentially introduce additional level of noise that we absolutely don't want. Excellent, thank you. Um, we have a question from the audience asking, uh, is it helpful to just show a site they are enrolling older patients than the average? Have you ever tried? They further say that you know sites are not aware of their metrics versus the average, nor are they often aware of what may be considered desirable baseline characteristics. Yeah, I mean, I know we're at time, so I'll briefly mention this is related to my presentation in some way you know i think to alan's point whenever you intervene you're you're going to probably introduce some change you know and I, and i think a good example of where it can be useful is, is you know let's take this age example i had you know you know calling up that site and saying you know you know your site is enrolling on average much older subjects than the study can you help me understand why right we're not asking them to change we're just highlighting that difference um, you know, there is a piece of the Hawthorne effect of, you know, we are observing that site, they know they're being observed, and, you know, the answer to that question, which they probably won't give, is, well, we have a competing trial with an upper limit of 45, right, or 50. So, you know, I think sometimes, you know, highlighting for sites that things are different can be helpful, uh, but again, you have to proceed with caution to Alan's point because you're going to introduce noise. All right, wonderful. Thank you very much for that answer. Um, and thank you all of you for your all of your answers today. However, we have reached the end of the Q&A portion of the webinar. Now, if we couldn't attend to your questions, though, the team of speakers will follow up with you. Or if you have further questions, you can direct them to their email addresses that are up on the screen. I want to thank everyone for participating in today's webinar. You will be receiving a follow-up email from Xtalks with access to the recorded archive for this event. A survey window will be popping up on your screen as you exit, and your participation is appreciated as it will help us to improve our webinars. Now I'm about to send you a link in the chat box, and with this link you'll be able to view the recording of this event on this page, and you can also share this link with your colleagues when they register for the recording here as well. So I encourage you to do that. Now, please join me once more in thanking our speakers for their wonderful time here today. We hope that you all found the webinar informative. Have a great day, everyone, and thank you for coming. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank